Good evening and welcome to the third Common Action Forum. Two years ago, at our inaugural event, we joined together in a discussion entitled The Steps of Progress in Times of Crisis, which enabled us to explore the foundations, objectives, missions of our young foundation. The following year, 2016, we explored the theme the rise of global fear. Why is the world becoming less tolerant and more radical? It was the eve of the US elections. Nationalists argued bluntly for expansion. Islamophobia was more accepted than ever in Western public opinion. And refugee crisis continued without any satisfactory solution. Today, we begin another conference to discuss the limits to inequality. It is an opportunity to formulate an understanding that overcomes rigorous narratives claiming utopic equality and cynicism that attempts to justify injustice. Nowadays, there is not much room to grow. Mars is still seems too far away, and on our planet, walls are trying to maintain exteriorities that no longer exist. And if we talk about human beings, the interior, biological, and psychological borders are vanishing in the same speed. Huge expansions, retractions, and voids, which if not filled, might soon explode. But despite any pessimistic diagnosis, we have no other choice than to take positive action in light of our contemporary and proposed alternatives. Since we are definitely living on the same boat, we need to examine our limits to inequality. So for this opening session, we will have a thought-provoking conversation Boda Kanta is president of the Common Action Forum and was director general of Al Jazeera for eight years, transforming the network into a global reference. He will converse with Antonio Escotado, one of the most renowned Spanish intellectuals that no one can claim indifference to and who has recently finished his great trilogy, The Enemies of Commerce. Arlene Plencha, professor at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, <coughs> as well as TV commentator, will moderate this session. The conversation will be 60 minutes long and followed by 30 minutes of exchange with the public. <coughs> I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Of what happened 
when instead of having equality with relationship to the law, we have this, uh, this desire of having material equality. Of course, material equality is not exactly uh, fitting to the differences that we have, not only uh, between uh, sexes, persons, but even inside the same family. We used to see families with four or five brothers. One of them is a entrepreneur and who develops industry and welfare. Another one is maybe an alcoholic. Another one is trying to use his brothers as a hanging perch for, for his needs. And, and the fourth one is maybe dead soon before getting into trouble. What is the limits to equality? Well, the limits to equality, in my opinion, are related to the fact that we normally believe that uh, consciousness, uh, well, uh, an order saying you do this, you do this, is really moving the world. I think that the world is being moved by unconscious anonymous, impersonal agent that, for example, Hegel called the objective Geist, objective spirit, that Adam Smith mentioned as an invisible hand, and Saint-Simon uh, mentioned as the hand of avarice, the hand of a man who wants to have everything for himself. I think it's about time that we recognize that mankind depends, depends a lot more on this inner and outer God that we can call the unconscious, that is uh, pervading all the technological innovation and that allows the world to grow even though we need the politicians to go to sleep. I mean, we have to use the time they're sleeping to progress. This is not, uh, I mean, I don't want to offend nobody. And there are great politicians, men of mind, men of independence, men who are capable to defy their, um, let's say, the interests of each party, like, uh, <laughs> We've seen uh, Gladstone or Churchill, but it's not frequent. Normally, the political parties they work as a sort of a criba, um, I should say in Spanish, a, a sort of way of uh, separating independent individuals from dependent individuals. That reminds me of a fragment of Heraclitus when he said that all the beasts that work in the field, they have to be led with a, with a stick, even though they're being led to their feed, to their food. Uh, also Heraclitus in the same fragment, I don't remember the name, mentions that weak men, weak women, they prefer to be led than taking their own opinions and their own initiatives. I think that there's an immense treasury in the initiative, in the, let's say, we act instead of waiting for somebody else, or orders or decisions from the outer world. I think we have enough reasons to believe in the absolute power of freedom and intelligence 
to govern in the world if we don't try to be messianic, if we don't try to exclude others. I finish saying that uh, economic problems, uh, economic uh, um, situation is based on multi-billion decisions made day by day by different individuals. If instead of this multi-billion um, decisions, you have 15, 17, 20 persons deciding on investment and consumption and credit, all that, you have a neurological collapse. I mean, it's like going from 20 billion cells acting in a moment to 15. This is medically a great problem. The person is about to die. Mm -hmm. um, making this a sort of a chronicle situation is the uh, common denominator of what's been happening in the 20th century as um, um, eugenics, like making the new man, making humanity better. That has been a general genocide. I think it's enough for my, my first opinion. Thank well, you very much. Thank you, yes. So please, what the... Thank you very much. And uh, to continue the discussion on the inequality, maybe slavery was the most you know, ugly manifestation of inequality. The slavery that converts the human being into a commodity owned by those who can afford to own and then deal with the human being, of course, uh, and deprive him from all forms of, of freedoms. Of course, all of us know that slavery has been delegalized and a lot has happened during the last few centuries in order to create a concept of equality and humanism, which is something amazing that happened to us in the, next, in the last 300 years and so. However, I can't really stop but thinking of the following. Did we really end slavery or did we try to reintroduce it in a new shape and form, much more cosmetically possible and acceptable and legalized sometimes? And therefore, yes, if you speak about economics in particular and the ownership of wealth and properties, we might argue that still, of course, there is a huge gap, but we succeeded in converting humans again into a form of production tool, depriving them from what they're supposed to be, which is independent entities pursuing some form of meaning and existence. Now, in my part of the world where I have come from, I cannot stop but, of course, sometimes feel angry about how unequal and how you know, the gap that has been created between those in the north and those in the south has been normalized, you know. Just a few days ago, a car exploded, of course, in, in, in Maqadishu, you have heard that. 600 people were uh, victims of that kind of explosion. The coverage of main Western media did not go beyond just occasional reports and a little bit of analysis here and there. While, for example, when in Manhattan something happens, of course, things go two days, three days of continuous coverage and breaking news and analysis. This is to say the least. This is from the realm where I have come from, media. I have witnessed that everywhere. I have witnessed it in every area of a human activity, not only in media. In politics, it is the same. In politics, the concept of democracy that has been, you know, the Bible of the Western civilization, of the people of the North, has actually uh, not been uh, uh, accepted to be implemented in the Arab world through the Arab Spring. And we have seen the silence of Western civilization, of Western governments, of course, uh, when, when the Arab Spring was murdered and democracy was pushed aside, and no one since then has bothered to actually repeat the word democracy. I have not, by the way, heard a politician in the West 
uh, that has been for the last two days, three, four years at least, mentioning anything about why don't we give these people some freedom? Because it seems normal that we shouldn't have the freedom and others must enjoy the freedom. If that is not inequality, then what equality uh, should be? Then you go into another field, you know, where, you know, our countries on foreign policies, of course, I understand that the system since West Valley is built on nation state. And then we have the concept of national interest. The concept of nation state and national interest, where most of our thinking about foreign policy is revolving around, has created this concept of also inequality. By regarding the state and its interest, interest the utmost religious you know, uh, goal where the politician or even a journalist or even whoever would like to be patriotic to follow. And this is when we started disregarding the concept of a human belonging, the concept of the human rights of certain people under the banner that the interest of the state determine that. And this is why even the United Nations, I cannot stop but thinking of the following, to what extent the humanity is benefiting from an organization which we thought after the Second World War will create this universal peace from actually doing this. I don't think that we are doing this because to a large extent it is caught within this kind of parameters of national uh, uh, interest and nation states and the agenda that it has been pursuing is limited by the necessities of these states in order to introduce to the public. I do believe that the humans at this moment in time are much more weaker than previous eras in history. I'm, I'm speaking about the humans, I'm speaking about ordinary people and I think a lot of our power has been centralized in the hand of the states which has become gigantic in its interference in our affairs and in the hand of economic, uh, economics, corporations and others. And I think there is a new mission for all of us to start thinking of ways to break away from that. Now, this is my basic uh, understanding of what's happening in the realm of politics, media and economics. However, the future is different. I see that the next few years, from 10 to 20 years, we are going to witness new challenges and the humanity is standing on a, a new frontier. The new challenges are going to be related to our relationship with time and space, with geopolitics, with economics, the rise of networking, the rise of artificial intelligence, the rise of biotechnology. These are not just something similar to the first and second and third industrial revolutions. These are not something that, you know, when we invented electricity, of course, everything changed. Our paradigm of thinking, our social order, and a lot has changed. But now, with this, if you would like to call it the fourth industrial revolution, there is something else happening, where we are reshaping the boundaries between a human being and the machine, in a different way. We are timbering with well-established norms since the Homo sapiens left Africa until today. We know that there is something called memory. Now we might have something called artificial memory inserted in our brains. So there are new challenges that will reshape the way that we interact with each other. The concept of networking, for example, is going to reshape the idea of distribution of power in a tribe, in a family, in a state, in a company, wherever you go, the concept of networking will convert that pyramid structure which we inherited generation after generation for the last few thousand years into something might be different. And we need to figure out how to benefit from it or how to limit its danger. So, one thing I can tell you about the future, I am sure about it, that nothing we know about the future or we at least figure out about the future right now is similar to what we have learned. And if you follow the capital of today, if you capital with what Microsoft or Google or Amazon or the big corporations are actually doing and investing the billions of dollars, they are really investing the billions of dollars in that field, the field of artificial intelligence and biotechnology and the field of nanotechnology and others which might reshape our, our environment and our habitat. Now, that might be good news for some of us, 
because we might use this concept of networking to introduce much more equal societies. We might decentralize the concept of centralized hegemonic entity of the state or economics. While we, I am watching today the price of Bitcoin rising to 7,300 or 400 this afternoon, which is unbelievable for something that I've just started a few years ago to really gain so much momentum. I don't know where it's heading. But the idea that humans are capable of alternative economic model, not passing through banks, is something I really appreciate. Where it is heading, I'm not sure yet. I'm not an economist. But something amazing. We use networking among citizens to create an alternative economic uh, um, model. And, and let us see where it's going. So I am sure that there is something positive happening. But also there is something terrible is going to happen. When that kind of superior human is created, where he is going to have super genes and super memory and super capabilities of physical you know, uh, powers, definitely we might end with something called superhumans and ordinary humans. And that might be another threshold of slavery, another way of looking down at other uh, people. And then those who cannot afford this high-tech technology, they might suffer the consequences and the gap might go bigger. So the result of all of the above mentioned, what the message I'm going to tell you today is the following. The battle of the future is not going to be based on geopolitics only. It's not going to be based on race or religion or culture. There is a global and human struggle to define our humanism and to protect it and to come up with a universal agenda that renews the debate and discussion towards a model which is ethically profound, which has virtue in it, but also at the same time could be rational and could be productive. Otherwise, we might face something that all of us you know, feel not comfortable with. Thank you very much. OK, well, thank you. Um, from what you both of you were, were saying, and with several points in common, actually, uh, Something I'd like to ask goes back uh, to one parallel with the moment or the period, the long, quite long period in history, two centuries, three centuries, which it took to not only create the nation state, but the idea uh, that the nation state was uh, desirable. It was a great degree of emancipation. That was how it was viewed in the past, up to the 19th century when many nation states were still forming. People saw the nation state as actually a, a vehicle for equality. But it wasn't real equality, of course. It was a fictitious equality, the equality of vote. You know, people would be equal in face of the state. They were not actually equal in terms of their wealth, of uh, gender, and so on and so on. But do you, do you believe that equality in gender or equality in wealth is somewhat desirable? Do you think that to have the same number of shoe of the, the same size of nose is going to benefit mankind in any way? Is not electricity, for example, based on the difference of potential, mm -hmm. on having um, Poles opposite. So what do you believe? I think that the only equality we can have is the equality under the law. I mean that we all have the same duties and we all have the same rights. And it's a long time we've been suffering victimism in different shapes. Finally coming from that famous sermon in which a person says, uh, oh, the, the protégés, the, the beloved by God, are the weak. Are the, we have to put first those who are last. This is a very difficult and violent operation. And it, uh, it's against the laws of nature that by conscious or unconscious, means inside the same family create 
persons who uh, trust their fellow beings and uh, decide to live a life, humble life, saying, well, I want the respect of my neighbor, that's enough. And the other ones that say, no, I want to lead mankind to some kind of emancipation. And we will do it by force if necessary. Of course, it is always necessary in those cases. And uh, this equality, I think uh, we don't need equality in the least. I should restrict it to equality of opportunities. But that is fulfilled in the, in the families. When I was speaking about a brother like this and the other brother like that, that is so obvious I don't have to lose any saliva in, in, in the matter. We don't have to be victimism. We have to believe that the spirit, that the soul, that intelligence is way beyond us, each individual person. We can believe that God, in that sense, God is the reality of things and the positive side of the world. And that has always been there, and it will always be there. We can forget about it, saying that, no, no, I received the revolution, and I received it um, in a way that it's only mine. Well, these people are sort of an um, analphabet and hate a lot other people and themselves. It's up to them to continue this sort of life. But with the internet, with the novelties now, what did the internet do? The internet finished distance. We don't have distance. We just don't have no distance. The only distance is the distance of the souls. Some people hate, some people love, some people study, some people lose their time. That's all. I mean, you don't have to say, oh, I have to benefit those who are stupid. Oh, they have enough with their stupidity. So the equal opportunities, I would take that. Okay, equality and opportunity and justice. As yeah, far as law is concerned. What, now, how do you find justice? Now, the most beautiful, the, I agree with you, but there is one important worry, practically speaking. Both the equality of opportunity and justice are defined in real time by entities, which we call states or you know, powers, centers of power within our societies, those who also are interested in preserving their interest and maximizing their profit, and therefore Imagine maybe, they would not have interests. Okay. That would but be this horrible. is the point. How would I guarantee a system that will produce, will be able and capable of sustaining this equality rather than utilizing it, as we see in many countries right now, utilizing it for, for the maximization of their own, of the elite, of those who own, and pushing away those who can't? Hmm. That's the question. Well, then you have again the victim uh, in sort of a resurrection of the victim. In my opinion, uh, you said very truthfully that uh, the covering of what happened in Mogadishu, this monstrous um, uh, explosion that killed 600 people, is, uh, is nothing. It's just a short thing in the news. But uh, don't you think that the great problems of the, this part of the world that we say Islamic, I mean, that believes that this nationality is absurd. We have to have this general obedience to God. Uh, this uh, Islamists mean this, if I'm not wrong. I mean, it's uh, submission to the will of God. And it has a problem with the printing machine, in my opinion. Gutenberg invented the printing machine. But the printing machine implies that every language produces, and if I'm not wrong, Quran saying that the truth is always in Arabic, in Arabic. And if you don't have it in Arabic, it's not really truth. This Just is, uh, make it uh, clear to me because I don't have it clear. 
I, I hear that this is textual. I mean, this is literal. So you have to have the truth in Arabic. Otherwise, it's not the truth. Then you have a problem with the printing machine. And then the, the consequence of this is that it's a world like uh, separated from the other world, even though we are totally the same. I mean, the men, the women, the children, the elder people, they are totally the same. But apart believes that the truth is concentrated in their culture and in their language. And so the, there's no nationalities, there are no particularities, there's no, uh, let's say, municipalities, uh, nothing besides the, the will of God. And of course, there are many gods, and there are people who are atheists, my friend. I'm not an atheist, by the way, but uh, you have to face this. You have to face competition. I think the great problem of um, at least uh, two thirds of the world that they're not adapted to competition. I mean, they are adapted to the tribes, the herds, the, you know, the, this, this situation of the primitive man, let's say a hundred thousand years ago, in which of course there was no private property. It, of course, everybody has a solidarity, full, full solidarity, but this, uh, this didn't produce wealth. This is not produce uh, the internet and all the previous things. Okay. Now, of course, I mean, I don't know where did you get this Arabic truth in the Quran because I personally, the first time I hear this, I mean, uh, the Muslims in the world, I think 1.5 billion, only 250,000, uh, 250,000 are Arabs. Proportion. But the rest, are not Arabs, and they read the Quran in Spanish and German in hundreds of languages, hmm? and they communicate with the truth that's supposed to exist in the Quran. So the fact is, I don't think that there is a monopoly of Arabic language over Quran. This is, uh, didn't come to my mind uh, at all. I've never heard of this. The second important element. In fact, you know, I, you know this kind of minimizing the Islamic world into kind of Muslims who are abiding to certain kind of phrases in the Quran or the concept of submitting to God, just like that, is a little bit you know, complicated. And that what led uh, the Islamic world and the Western civilization to clash into many levels. I've never thought of this uh, as a religious, actually, uh, clash between the two entities. Because if you go through history, it has never happened like that. We had interests like any other nations, Muslims and the Europeans fought in the crusading, in the crusaders, and then we have colonialism. We were, it's something like any other nation in the world. And Islam in this concept, when it comes to politics and economics, was never actually uh, an obstacle of developing alternatives in every form. And always I argue that enlightenment started in the Islamic world, not in Europe. My long time before the, Islam, before the Europeans. But Islam. the issue the issue is not about religion. I think the issue, frankly speaking, and this is what I think, that the Western civilization with time developed very strong center of gravity when it comes to intellectualism, to self-interest, and also to see the world from one point of view. And everyone was a victim of that, including the Muslim world, including Asia, including more than us, maybe Africa, when I think that goes back to a perception that was created that once you are in the north, once you are in Europe, you have the authority, the moral authority, even the religious authority, and going back to religion, I don't want, of course, to say how that was justified in a Christian terminology. When we invaded Africa, we enslaved the people, we regarded Latin Americans different, and we regarded the indigenous people in Australia or in Canada, not even humans. So that religion also was used to justify kind of things, although, as again, I agree that the issue is not the religion. The issue is a selfish human being trying to maximize his dominance. And that, for the last three, four hundred years, the humanity has suffered from this concept of a central, you know, vision that was created to dominate. I am arguing that the future should be of diversity. True. I think civilizations, including the Muslim or the African or the Asian or the Latin Americans, we have very rich 
heritage and culture that if we tap into it and we get this kind of a humanistic nature that exists everywhere, I think the humanity will be much more safe. We don't need to witness 600 people killed in, in Maqadishu, and we don't want to see you know, Iraq invaded by the Americans. But the concept itself needs to be developed. And the intellectuals in the West, and of course in, in the rest of the world, but I, I regard the West in particular, and I insist on it, not because I am racist, or I think that the Western people are different. I think most of us sitting in this room share the same ideas. And this is why we gather for Common Action Forum, because we do believe that this concept of diversity and the concept of legitimacy as well of various thoughts and ideas and techniques could reshape our perspective of centralization of power that has been, for the last two, three centuries, creating major inequality and major, OK, let us forget the word of inequality, major injustice, major marginalization, confiscation of territories. Our buildings, most of them have been built because we have enslaved the public. We have enslaved hundreds of millions of people and we built civilization. That was history, I agree, but we don't want to be stuck in it. But we need to admit that we were not just. And the result of today, when we bring justice to everyone else, we don't take the Western advice in the Islamic world very serious or in Africa or in Asia, because still we could see the consequences of that concept of discrimination against these kind of civilizations. And we need to rehabilitate that and to fix that kind of injustice in order to resume our, our, our I don't know, march for, for justice. <laughs> <laughs> well, Excuse me, uh, implicit uh, in your aversion to the idea of, of defending equality, of course, is totali totalitarianism, right? Yeah. And uh, in your speeches about what you spoke about, um, uh, the problem of following, of simply following given ideas, of not having a critical thought, of not being capable of, okay, how can society, the question would be, given what both of you had said, putting them converging, how can society start not being led, but to lead at the same time preventing the, uh, the, the pitfalls of social media, which, I mean, basically, to put it, would be the, 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 the threat of uh, banalization. We can even think of Hannah Arendt's banalization of evil, which is you know, the incapacity to think you know, and to just follow what the masses are saying, being it through the nation state, being it through counter you know, uh, forces such as social media. You just mentioned Hannah Arendt, but she did not have the notion of complexity. She was uh, the princess of the female thought. In the middle of the 20th century, I, I admire her very much. But she was not aware of what we can call the paradigm of complexity that before I was mentioning as objective Geist in Hegel philosophy or like the presence of the impersonal, anonymous, unconscious factor that really creates, for example, the development of technique Let's be clear about Islam. It was the world's leading power in progress, in openness for the world. From the 8th century to the 14th century, when Ibn Haldun published this fantastic prolegomena and developed the notion of asabiya, which means cohesion, um, and he understood universal history on the scheme that a group of few people became very unified and uh, took over the world and created, let's say, the Roman civilization, the Arabic civilization, the Greek civilization, Asabiya. It was a sort of eternal cycle in which either you get united or you get uncoordinated, and then, you, like life, you die because of that, because the cells don't work. Well, what is the difference between the paradigm, paradigm of complexity and the previous paradigm? Well, you use or you don't use the totality of your neurons. 
when I was speaking about uh, a society like uh, ours, where billions of actions are being decided every moment by everybody, and when we think about a society, let's say, uh, that happens in the whole world, uh, but not in the Western civilization, then of course we realize that we're not using the total brain capacity. So the problem of prosperity that you see that in, in the Netherlands, people are prosperous, even though it is a horrible climate. There's, an, there's nothing there that uh, should allow a person coming from Ghana or Nigeria to maintain their life. It's only here. It's know-how. So the development of know-how is directly connected with the freedom you give to the neurons to work. And how do you give freedom to the neurons? Well, you don't have dogma. If you have dogma, the neurons are going to collapse like the brain or like the heart in a, in a fit. So I think that what the world has learned is to say that its own interest is not against the interest of the rest. That the best interest of the whole is respecting your, new, your neighbor and understanding that nobody will ask your action unless you're a master in the field that you've decided to devote yourself to. I mean, the, whole, the opposite to victimism is say, man, believe in yourself, work on yourself, look for yourself, know that God is inside you, not outside you. Look for it, look for the God inside. And that means working in a thing that your neighbor considers useful. Don't think that you will get nothing else besides the respect of your fellow beings. Last, uh, I think, like four or five weeks ago, I was in Canada, and I attended the ceremony of the new Canadian uh, citizens. So the Chief Justice came and delivered a fantastic speech to the new uh, citizens who have been granted the certificate of citizenship that day. And she, actually, the Chief Justice, when she spoke to them, she said, now Canada is in need for you. And Canada should be, you know, your, I mean, you should pay back to Canada in a form of political participation. Each one of you should go out, become part of the politics. You must run for elections. You must join mensibility. You must go to the parliament. That's your duty towards the country. At lunch, she was sitting next to me, and I said to her, exactly, this is the same advice we give to the people in our countries because we tell them, if you want to go to jail, please go to politics, you know? So what you are saying is, I wonder where that access to our neurons could exist, you know, if the, most of our political systems outside certain countries or economic system is in a way or another pushing you into certain kind of order. I think our fight is not about religions, and about whether God is inside or outside. Definitely there is a beautiful deb debate to have. But I think there is structural injustice in the current international economic and political systems. Most of our governments are actually pushing people not to use their neurons. And if they do, most likely, like what's happening in Egypt right now or in many other countries in the Arab world or the, or the rest of the world, not only, they end in jail. So our fight is for freedom, definitely. Our fight is for equal opportunity. Our fight to liberate the human being to make his own choice mm. and to continue. If someone decides to deal with God as someone outside or inside, I would argue that this is his personal affair. I'm not going to force him to do this or that, but at least let us agree in the principle that we have the choice to continue our pursuit of the truth or our pursuit of if you like to call it justice, you know, in a sound foundations. This is important. And the last remark, and I want to refer to the concept of social media, since it is something that I'm very connected to, and I do believe that we have a great opportunity. 
of definitely transcending the concept of space into another frontier. So when we formed this concept of Common Action Forum, for example, I think a lot of us communicated through internet. And right now, a lot of our forums and meetings happen because we are capable of sitting together and deciding on matters that we share. And this is important because it redefines nationalism as well. So in my team right now where I run a lot of you know, NGOs and so on, I don't think I need to see them physically beside the fact that I can communicate from South Africa to Latin America to Russia through internet. And that space is redefining the concept of the tribe I came from. My tribe consisted of a chief and many other people around him. They go every day to the council and sit together and decide on matters related to their tribe. The tribe today exists everywhere in the world. We communicate and we, define, we decide, we vote, we you know, agree on certain values. So definitely there is a new structural, a new social structure emerging through networking and through media. Social media might be a disturbance for now, but this is for short. With time, people will learn where to pick up the right information and to capitalize on it. But networking is much more larger and positive trend that maybe it will really save us from a lot of discrimination that happened during the last few uh, centuries. That's right, I believe so. But uh, I mentioned Ibn Khaldun in 14th century and the Asabija because in my opinion, problem, the basic problem of Islam is that it, it, it believes that still in the 14th century. My, I, I mean, what happened yeah. since uh, Ibn Khaldun published his monumental prolegomena? Well, it didn't happen nothing. Okay, now, I am, of course, a student of Ibn Khaldun. I personally respect his thoughts and ideas. Mm -hmm. Someone was the founder of what we call social sciences at that time. And definitely, when he spoke about the concept of asabiyya, which in my opinion, one of the main, like few other concepts that he spoke about in his I'm great volume called the introduction, the muqaddimah. When he spoke about the concept of asabiyya, he was analyzing what is in front of him. Like also the philosophers of enlightenment when they spoke the divine right of the kings in Europe. Yeah. When you now mention it, it, it looks bizarre. It looks to us like, you know, what the hell is happening? But now Ibn Khaldun, six, seven centuries before that, he referred to his reality. He described the political structure of his time and he analyzed what's happening around him and he found the concept of asabiyya the appropriate description of reality, not the ideal that the humanity should remove to. Because while Ibn Khuldun, by the way, was doing that kind of concept, he was also defending another concept where humans, regardless of their race and religion and whatever it is, they could be part of something else. He himself was a manifestation, was a minister in the court in, yeah. in, in, in this in part Cairo. of the world, in, uh, later on in Cairo. But before that, he started, of course, in Morocco. And I think, in my opinion, we, the concept of, of Islamic State between two brackets, also now the concept of Islamic State is associated with ISIS. But just to go back to Ibn Khaldun time, which is like 1,000, I don't know how, yeah, nearly, years ago. Nearly. Now, Ibn Khaldun, when he described the state, it was very clear that his state is not our modern state. His state was only in charge of protecting the borders and keeping the safety of the public while our state is interfering in every essence. The judiciary in Ibn Khuldun ideas and thoughts and the state was not owned by the state itself. It was owned by the public because the, the justice system and the judges are nominated by the public to rule. The, the, the judiciary, the ulama, the judiciary itself or the, you know, the, the, the laws are produced by people who do not take salaries from the state people who are produced by the society itself. So I would look at his state as maybe third of the power of the current state that we have. And his state is much more friendly to the humans because it does not have that kind of intervention in every single aspect of, of people's life. So if you want to get, speak it's about Ibn Khaldun, what a nice man he was. I mean, it's really. not a welfare state, not in the least. <laughs> Actually, in the, in the concept of Ibn Khaldun, the state, part of what it used to do, and that is a tradition within the Islamic State from the time of the second caliph of Islam, Umar, is that every person born in the state is entitled 
to minimum income that sustained his life, regardless of his father and mother. That was the rule. And that continued to be the case for generations. I didn't until, know of course, that. I of didn't course, know that. That was, of course, yesterday we were discussing the concept of inequality, the concept of basic income. That was enshrined within the concept of the Islamic State from the 10 years after the death of Prophet Muhammad until generations of, the, of the, what we call the Islamic Empire later on. So maybe you don't need actually the defense of any equality to defend the idea of a certain limit to inequality. Oh, we agree. Yeah. Could you develop a bit more? <laughs> I agree totally. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. uh, you see, for example, now in Spain, which has not been the wealthiest country in the world, but now you see when you come up to this building, you look around, you see the floors of the buildings, uh, you look at the floor, and you say, what a difference if I was in Bangkok or if I was uh, simply in Montevideo, which is a very civilized uh, country in Latin America. I would not mention Bolivia, for example. <laughs> it, what happens here? It's a sort of a polishing, unconscious uh, a po uh, polishing of things that make them uh, uh, all the time better without anybody taking care of that. It's something like an investment, like an unconscious investment that in the other parts of the world doesn't happen. We have to have this other part of the world to incorporate themselves to this. Uh, we say in Spanish, amortización. Uh, it means that you have to take into account that things get used and old and, and, and you have to pay, you have to save some part of the present. Uh, to make things at least as they were, and if you can polish them like it happens in the Castellana where, where we are now. I remember this place when I was 15. I'm nearly 80. It has changed a lot, even though the buildings are the same. Now we have solid foundations, and it's not because nobody said this or that. In my opinion, is because we left the neurons to work on themselves. We didn't uh, produce collapses of the heart or of the brain, trying to make things better, being stupid uh, human individuals that cannot contain the, the immense knowledge that things have in, in themselves. OK. Now, of course, uh, just uh, something came to my mind while we're speaking about the 14th century dogma, which you refer to. There are two major people who influence a lot of us in the Islamic world. And uh, it happened that they influenced a lot in the Western civilization. One of them is called Ibn Rushd, who was born just next door here in Cordoba. And his name is Averos in English. And he was, uh, he was actually the one who introduced the concept of rational thinking to the rest of Europe. And his students from the royal courts of Europe came back in order to reintroduce enlightenment. And the second one is Ibn Arabi. He was also born yeah. in Murcia, mm. by the way, which is next door as well. Greatest and, poet. And huh? Ibn Arabi as well, he introduced another tradition of spirituality and the concept of humanism where all humans, regardless of their religion, this is his famous poetry that, I mean, they, since they are created by one God, so they are equal in every form and sense. These two major traditions were the final culmination of what we call the Islamic tradition and civilization, a rational and a spiritual. Both of them existed, and both of them, by the way, flourished in Andalusia during that period. Now, what happened after that to an extent that right now we can kill 600 people in one explosion in, Madrid, in, in Somalia, and that is just a normal thing that happens, of course, in Syria and Iraq and everywhere in the Arab world. Yes, definitely there is a problem in the Islamic world. I acknowledge that. But of course, there is a deep political issue and geopolitical issues that happen. I mean, three, four hundred years of strife and struggle and confrontation that also led to paralyzing the natural growth 
of the human, of the Islamic mind into, you know, what in the West was called later on Renaissance and modernity and in the Islamic world, we found ourselves face to face with this concept that we could not accommodate. But I can't for a moment, you know, defend what also the West has done to us in, 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 in the in form of colonialism, in a form of discrimination, in a form of slavery that led to a huge battle to, of, for existence, not even development. I think we were busy trying just to exist, try to survive, try to live, rather than to develop a new paradigm of thinking. So there, is, there are reasons for that. And Islam, per se itself, was never a force of, of freezing the progress towards rationalism or towards spirituality, but it was, in fact, a power behind it. It was interrupted by what could, to any society, create paralysis, which is discrimination, which is foreign uh, occupation, and which is also colonialism. So, you know, to look at it from where I have come from, I don't see it a dogmatic issue. I see it a, a political and, uh, you know, a, cl a clash that actually happened, and we were the losing party of it, and we found ourselves trying to defend rather than to build upon and to flourish. You're much more informed about this thing than I am, so I... I <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not enter into the question. Uh, I could ask you, for example, if Buddhism has developed a sort of a problem with the world outside, as Islamism has developed a problem, obvious problem. Buddhism? Uh, yeah, Buddhism or Taoism or uh, Hinduism or the other religions, I don't think they isolate the people. And for sure, not more than 1,000 million like we have in, in Islam. Uh, I was one year in Thailand recently, sabbatical year, and I saw that the only social problem that existed in Thailand was the Muslim minority. It was in the south part of the country. It, I don't think it is objective to believe that uh, colonialism affected more Islam than Buddhism, or affected Taoism, or other religions of animism, for example, all over the world. I think Islam isolated itself of the world, believing in dogma. What is to believe in dogma? It means that you believe more in what you hear than in what you see. It, Heraclitus, fragment 81, if I'm not wrong, said these people, that kind of trust more what they get through the ear than what they get through the senses. These people are sleeping, he said. I think Islam has been in a deep slumber from the epoch of fantastic epoch of Averroes. I'm Aristotelic. I've been studying Averroes' interpretation of Aristotle as the, as the nearly the absolute truth. So, and even Arabi, I have enjoyed very much his poetry too. But then I say, what has happened since the 14th century? I think it's intolerance and dogma, basically. But I might be wrong. You know much better than I do about the facts. The only problem is that right now we're reaching limits of um, uh, touching, um, touching the let's say, sensibility of people. When we hear about thousands of people deciding to kill others just because of that, we haven't seen that for a long time. We had that for the first time with the Jewish zealots. These are the origin of the fanatic. Fanatic means people that come from the fun, the temple. And we have these kind of people. But now the world is bewildered, it's, it's astonished, is horrified. And I'm very much afraid of a reaction, an irrational reaction, in which you say in Spanish, paguen justos por pecadores. Uh, that means uh, I don't mind. I mean, I will kill a hundred if I can kill a single individual of this line. 
we cannot tolerate this to our societies. It will blame us, it will cover us with, uh, with horror. But the tension doesn't come from these societies. I mean, Buddhism is not being attacked by Western civilization. Islam is OK, big. you know, because you have not been in Baghdad when one million people were killed. Yeah, you have seen in Madrid horrible. an explosion where tens of people sadly were also murdered by a Muslim crazy suicide bomber. I have seen the one million people slaughtered. No, no. But that was projected on TVs as just a legitimate action of war. I saw it as a crime that really made me extremely angry. I was in Afghanistan when I was counting bodies of humans, children, men and women. I remember phoning the American base to inquire about an attack against a wedding and they refused to admit that it was a wedding while I was seeing in front of me the woman in wedding dress killed with all the wedding party. Most so right. the, um, what I'm saying to say, would I at that moment say this is the Christian civilization, the Western civilization, damn this civilization that has created this kind of destruction. If it is a matter of how much destruction has been done to, ter to properties and to human life, I would argue that Muslims really, if they become crazy, that might be something from a neuron point of view could be understood. Although I am, by the way, condemned by all forms of, of groups in, in the Middle East. But the issue is, I would say, you know, there is a bias of understanding reality, and this bias is tilting towards the West. And this is what filters to people's mind. So when a crazy guy goes and kills and does, that becomes a major issue, which is definitely a major issue. I don't argue against that. But when we are in that part of the world witnessing, you know, decade after another, not just in the last few years, decade after another, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people murdered just because a certain country decided to invade or to fight or to banish or to change the regime that is not represented on media or not represented amongst intelligentsia as it's supposed to be. And then we are blamed for other things that is happening in a way. Yes, terrorism is a phenomena that we suffered from more than the West. Yeah, more the than terrorism of, of Islamic groups that have conducted this kind of terrorism in Turkey more than what happened in, in, in London or Paris or wherever you, it is. You or in Baghdad or in, Syria, in Damascus. It's definitely what, what just evil. Happened in Mogadishu. But also the terrorism of the machine of war against our land was a huge. It doesn't make it right when it is conducted by a member in the United Nations or a member of the five permanent countries in the, in the Security Council. It is also ugly, it is bad, it should be condemned. And this is what creates a lot of anger and the frustration amongst the generation that's supposed to be searching for happiness, but they are now actually angry and searching for revenge. And that's not the healthy thing that we are facing. As I said to you, we are suffering from that more than anyone else. You are, but for example, I should uh, believe that the war of Iraq not is, it's not only a ridiculous uh, historical fact, but I should accept that it was provoked by some uh, military contractors of the United States to get a little bit more money and funds. I could accept that thing. Um, it's the most probable uh, um, causal uh, action. Uh, uh, but this, but, uh, this happens after the Twin Towers uh, uh, problem. And the Twin Towers happens after the Nairobi uh, tremendous uh, action I was there in the, in the moment, I mean, not in the, in the area. But uh, no, I think, my friend, uh, you cannot blame colonialism or ac actions of violence of the West, even though there have been many and probably will be many more. Uh, I think it's not this. I think it's a spirit, a, a national soul or an international soul that suddenly gets aside in the in the path of freedom, and reality, how, and, and and how would you explain the the uprisings called the Arab Spring then, 
Wouldn't it be also a totalitarian view to see only the dogma that He exists knows much in better than me how to answer that question. I'm not informed about that. You should when, when the Arab Spring happened, you know, I think the people who really fought in the streets of Cairo and, and, and Tunisia and Yemen and Libya were not actually dogmatic. I mean, we have seen Muslims, Christians, we have seen secularists, nationalists, Islamists, everyone together, you know, rallying for democracy and freedom. You know who let them down? The international powers, to a large extent. I remember delivering a speech in the, in the Euro European Union Council when, I mean, they invited someone to speak about the European, uh, the Arab uprising. After the elections in Egypt, that brought Muslim Brotherhood to power. So, of course, I would say that uh, most of the people there initially were celebrating the concept of Arab Spring. After the so-called elections and the rise of Islamists to power, it became a little bit crazy that they thought, okay, these people, democracy is bringing us the bad guys. So in the discussion about this particular point, I remember a representative of Spain, by the way, <laughs> he asked the following question. He said, you know what, how do you expect us to support Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt who are suppressing women? I said, sorry, excuse me, repeat the question. He said, they are not dealing with women as supposed to be dealt with, and they don't have equality, although, of course, this is baseless, because, I mean, Muslim Brotherhood, they sent to parliament more than any other party uh, of women. No, but the issue, I said, do you really, really in this council, define your relationship with countries in our part of the world based on their treatment of women? They said, of course, this is very important criteria. I said, please, could you tell me how is your relationship with Saudi Arabia at that time? Why are you lying? Okay, tell me the truth. Tell me that I don't want these kind of people because I think they contradict my national interest. Let us speak about it. Don't deceive me by giving me a moral speech about the rights of women when you are guilty of working with the most aggressive, most repressive regimes in the Middle East and you're celebrating them and you don't even utter a word for their rights. So this kind of double standards that created a lot of, of problems for us as well. So when you speak about the Arab Spring, yes, we have a lot of people inside our countries who stood for counter-revolutions. A lot of money was spent from rich countries against counter-revolutions, but also we have the silence and we have the betrayal, actually, of the international society, of those young people who are supposed to have transferred our societies from the dark moment that we are passing through into enlightenment of freedom and democracy. But we did not do it. Oh, my friend, but do you really think Islam is not uh, <laughs> behaving with women in a sort of um, anachronic way? At least my wife is happy, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, I don't want to go about women and Islam because this is a very old debate. Our countries, like every country in the world, we are going what through about major the discussion. What about the ablation? The what? Ablation of clitoris. Sorry? Ablation of clitoris. It's not Islamic. What about the uh, ablation of the... It's not it has nothing to do with Islam, by the way. Nothing? At all. It's condemned by all major Islamic scholars, oh, I'm glad. generation after another. It is a I'm tradition glad. of certain societies. It's out of a tradition. It has nothing to do with Islam. I've, I really, myself, I've never known about this concept until I came to the West because a lot of people make it a big issue about Islam. But I know that, for example, I'm living in the, in, 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 from Palestine to Jordan to many countries of the Islamic world all my life. I've never come across a woman who did that. Yeah. It happened, there are tribes in certain territories, maybe in Sudan, maybe some, I don't know where, other countries, but it is a tribal culture, it's not Islamic. It has nothing to do with mm -hmm. the Sharia. Neither my, I I'm mean, I've never come know. across a woman in my environment, at least, that have gone through that I was experience. wrong then, my friend, yeah. I'm sorry. I was simply wrong. About the, the, also, there's a problem with the polygamy. I mean, the Western laws, they have this uh, issue on, uh, on marriage, the institution of marriage. I think we are not, you I mean, have to divorce <laughs> before you can have, uh, let's say, five or ten wives. And if you are yeah. the king of Saudi Arabia, maybe you have a hundred. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. If I was a young guy, I would love that kind <laughs> of regime. Huh? 
<laughs> would strongly support it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but the, uh, the problem is not that. The problem is that I hear once and again, for example, uh, a young lady was working in my house as a, as a well, cleaning the house, and the fathers, uh, of, uh, they will not allow her to go to, to the beach, for example, in a normal way. They will take incredible care about maintaining her virginity, which is the patrimony of her family, have to sell that uh, in the right moment. This is anachronic, I think, in the world. I mean, I'm not objecting morally to this. I'm just saying that this thing is a kind of a habit that isolates certain persons from the others that are following a different path. So you need to, in this logic, I mean, Africans who have their own traditional culture, Asians who have their own traditional culture, and Latinos who have their traditional culture will be okay. also excluded because you are referring to certain standards or values as the universal standard that every human being in the world no. should adopt. Otherwise, he's isolating you himself. No, I don't I say think, that. I think it is not the truth. I mean, no, I don't say Frankly that. speaking, and I lived know. 12 years in Africa, uh, and I have across, came across magnificent cultures of African tribes and traditions and societies, which I respect very well. I might not taste positively certain kind of practices, but I understand it. And this is the spirit, as a journalist and as a, someone who has been traveling the world, that I have dealt with the world and understood it. I don't think there would be one standard where all of us should follow, and then we can say, you know, know, if the woman, they don't go to the beach in bikini, it means that we are not civilized. I mean, this no, is definitely a different that, You pressure. sell the, the hymen of the woman, or you sell the virginity. Okay. Uh, I mean, this is a, a patrimony we don't accept in Western worlds, but imagine we had, yeah. let's say, 50 million European emigrated to Africa. It would create a problem in, in Africa. They will probably be received with I've, heavy machine guns in the beaches. I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt when it's starting to, you know... Yeah. It's starting to get but the heat up. We should, yep. Yeah. <laughs> we should let the public participate in this debate now. Okay. Uh, we'll take three questions at a time and then both of them will have like four or five minutes to answer. Please, one minute maximum for each question so that we can keep this in time. So I see one person here, two and three. Those who have the mics, please. One person down here lifted her hand first. Could you say your name and the question? Yes, good afternoon. My name is Fernando Ron Martin. I'm a member of the, of the board of CAF. Okay. My question is, for getting, not seeking, for, for getting uh, equality, is it enough just having equality under the law, as Mr. Cotado says, which is a pretty nice uh, liberal point of view, or do we need something more, like, for example, uh, a basic income or some of the things that Mr. Kampfer arrived, because if we take the second position, the state will have a very active role to play. Thank you. Very well. Okay. Over here. Who was it here? Yes. Oh, okay. Hi. I, I think talking about inequality, clearly out of this discussion, I realized that there is also a historical inequality in understanding the world politics. Um, first of all, there was a hint of celebrating nationalism. I mean, for us who come from Africa, nationalism has been a disaster because of flimsy drafting of borders which did not take into consideration the distribution of tribes, for example. Whilst nationalism might have been a great thing for the Europeans because it guaranteed rights and equality, for Africans it had been a disaster. People are separated, and as a result, the continuing wars that we see are as a result of that nationalism. So there is that inequality in understanding history and its implication uh, from the Europeans. That's the first point. The, the, the second point is there is also inequality in terms of publication of academic and research on how the world political decisions which emanated from, the, from Europe affected the world. So we are discussing now based on the information or education which is Eurocentric. 
but some of us are exposed to different kind of information, uh, which if translated will totally contradict everything that's been said uh, at the moment. So there is that inequality, which I think perhaps the internet, as we continue or try to populate the internet with new information, should take that into consideration, that we need to, to, to ingest the new relevant information on the internet so that the history or future information to our kids and, gen and grandchildren can reflect the reality of the world. Because it is very clear that even this discussion, it is extremely Eurocentric. It's not taking consideration the reality of what's happening in the ground. For example, there's been this criti crit criticism of uh, certain cultures and people having less neurons to apply, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we are not talking about the privilege which has been presented or not presented by the European colonizers, for example, in Africa. How do we achieve full potential if there's been a historical deprivation of us to use our neurons to the full capacity? That's not taken into consideration. The assumption is that all is equal, all was normal. No, it was not normal. Uh, there was a concerted effort of depriving and oppressing people as a result. Then the conclusion was those people who live in the global south are not capable of, of using the full capacity of their neurons uh, because of their geogra geographical trapping. And that has to change. So the point I'm trying to make is that they, we need to re redress the historical inequality of information so that all of us can be or can have access to the new information that will truly reflect the human history because right now it's too eurocentric and i don't think it reflects the true reality of humanity as it stands thank you sir i believe you gave us a lecture instead of asking us a question and the third uh, question please yes Good evening, everyone. My name is Bilal. I come from the same part of the world where Wadah is coming from. I just wondering why Islam came at the discussion, Islam and uh, uh, the way Muslims. I think the pure form of inequality in what you said, Mr. Antonio, is that that Muslims. You said Muslims, Islam. You're generalizing the whole Muslim population. Muslims. I don't know how much they are in billions. Turks are Muslims, Indonesia are Muslims, Malaysians are Muslims, they're totally different, they have different culture, different traditions, different way of, of even practicing their Islam. So this is where the colonization or the Western perspective of things actually is a form of inequality. This is why I just want to comment. Thank you. I didn't understand okay. really what he said. He was also commenting um, on, on the, the on what you said about Islam, about having a, one view of Islam. Like a unified yes. phenomenon. Yes. <laughs> okay, so let's go to um, four or five minutes each, please. Please. Okay. Well, uh, apparently I have a unify, unified um, conception of Islam. Well, if I don't have a better information, I will keep on up to it because I, I have not received any other um, any other basis of data. I should remember you of Edward Said, Said, who was uh, wrote a very famous book called Orientalism, if I'm not wrong, about 1976, complaining that the Eurocentrism. It's a way of answering also the other question. Eurocentrism is is well. Um, diffused along the world, and it is, as any centrism, unfair and absurd. Yes, is there in any other part of the world chairs devoted to archaeology, history, philology, understanding and maintaining languages that are, have disappeared? Besides the Western world, has the notion of Eurocentrism or earlier uh, uh, Roman centrism or Islamocentrism has any other different origin than the public money that the Europeans or the North Americans or the Canadians or the Australians pay so that professors devote their life 
to study a civilization that is so absolutely alien to their own heritage that can maintain, can maintain for example, Kaiurao in India, or the fantastic ruins in Cambodia, or the ruins of the Maya in the, in the Inca Empire. Can we attribute to the Western world a sort of an indifference to the other world? Or is it just precisely the other way around? How much public money do you devote to the study of Western civilization in other parts of the world? Said said that we don't understand Islamic institutions, but never wrote a single line about Islamic institutions. I even doubt if he spoke Arabic. He was, had a full chair as professor at the University of Columbia in the state of New York. Edward Said? Who is that? Edward Said, Orientalism. Wow. Edward Said. He was one of the first uh, who died on the AIDS epidemics. By and the way, like uh, Michel Foucault, I think it was the third or fourth in the line. When we have public money, let's say in Tehran or in uh, Casablanca, devoted uh, to what Said said, we will have the balance uh, in, in the right side. For example, in Oxyrhynchus, they found nearly three tons of debris of little pieces of little pieces of, of writing. They've thrown there as rubbish. We have been 135 years studying that, basically in the University of Oxford, with funds from the whole world. We have obtained, with that, approximately 200 volumes of literature that would have been lost in another case. This work of maintaining what has died three, 2,000 years ago is a thing we should be proud of and that should be remembered. When we speak of a Western civilization as Eurocentric, we forget that the spirit of liberty the spirit of justice is being maintained by this civilization, only by this civilization, in my opinion. I'm ready to acknowledge that I'm wrong. Would I possibly put one question, which is, isn't the idea itself of a Western civilization uh, problematic in the way that it excludes the way in which history is a lot more uh, permeated than, you know, self uh, uh, in, in enclosed, like Western civilization, as if it could be defined as something in itself. I mean, doesn't it owe a lot more to the rest of the world? And isn't the rest of the world contributing a lot more to these universities? And don't we have maybe People the rest from, of the world contributing a lot to the University of Oxford. The rest of the world contributing a lot to the University of Oxford. And and also in terms of when you think of okay, what is the rest of the world studying? When I where I come from, Brazil, to us, to our children in school I and mean, throughout school, history, unfortunately, is still European history. I mean, the, the colonization of our minds is so big that we don't even see the rest of the world. But how, how did Europe uh, become a civilizer or colonizer instead of colonized or civilized? Well, through history. <laughs> yeah, and this is called action, and the other thing is called passivity. And, or not. And then we come down to the issue of this debate, which is the limits to inequality, because inequality among people inside certain states and inside bigger entities as so-called civilizations and throughout the world can be maybe the, the, the you know, underlying problem which we have to think about how to uh, deal I with. I started you know? talking about the inside the family. 
I started talking that these inequalities happen inside the family. And if you don't uh, deny that, I think that you shall accept the rest of the argument. Uh, okay, I mean, just to I mean, correct an information, because maybe it needs to be co co corrected. Edward Said, who I know as a Palestinian academic is a Palestinian. and freedom fighter mm -hmm. and politician and thinker mm -hmm. and writer, who I personally benefited a lot of his beautiful Arabic lectures to the young people of Palestine, and I carry the tradition of Edward Said mm -hmm. in many thoughts and ideas. When you introduced him, he sound to me, not the one who I know, you know? Edward Said was the greatest critic of the concept of Orientalism based on the Eurocentric approach to our culture and civilization, and he introduced another alternative of how to understand the Orient, you know? So, in a way or another, sometimes where you stand uh, is, you know, uh, define your judgment. And I think, okay, I, mean, I would accept that this is your right. You stood in an in a area which you rightly said that the Western civilization introduced to us magnificent achievements, which I don't argue against. But if, you, chair for Said. if, you, chair for if Said. you were one of us in the rest of the world, you would have also a parallel narrative to tell about the Western civilization. If you were a South African, definitely apartheid will definitely live with you for long generations to come. If you were living in the Middle East, definitely the concept of Israel and the discrimination against the Palestinians and the Balfour Declaration, which we today, Britain, celebrating 100 years mm -hmm. of it, is also live with you for a long time to come. It will come to you that the colonization of Africa and slavery and many other stories will also be a product of the so-called Western civilization. I'm not saying the Western civilization is evil, but I am saying there is some form of approach that, in my opinion, should be multi-level you know, level approach to this and to establish the Western civilization as a distinct only product from Western people is, in my opinion, also another systematic wrong. Why? Because I think it is a result and the culmination of achievements of a humanity that re reached a moment of Oxford and Harvard. And Oxford and Harvard have been built definitely on a legacy of Al-Azhar and Al-Zaytuna in Tunisia and many other great universities across the world. So it is, mm -hmm. I won't see civilization as an ownership of some group mm -hmm. of humans I don't. who happen right now to own a lot of the world wealth and I would see it as a continuation of a, a human endeavor to achieve you know, progress and, and success in, the, in their lives. Right, but Said was a professor in New York. I will uh, yeah, simply he was ask. Columbia, of course. Yes, By the end simply of the time, ask is yeah. if there the is politics, any chair. Yes, I agree. Yes, it, yeah, I agree. And he suffered himself personally from a lot of discrimination when he was also in that university. And that well, he was suffering discrimination, but he was earning a good salary as an American professor. <laughs> Or oh, am I wrong? Okay, so here, uh, Eduardo Suplicy, the second question there, and one more. Okay, we have our three here. Uh, quick questions, please. Where's the mic? Yeah, not lectures. Okay, um, my name is Eduardo. <laughs> I uh, wanted to take back to the original topic of the limits of inequality. And uh, Mr. Antonio said that, well, of course, it's uh, inevitable that we are different from each other. We are humans, after all. We are not ants or a coral reef either. And uh, he explained how even inside families there are very different outcomes despite having the same opportunities. And I say, yes, um, inequality is unavoidable. But uh, as you may know, since we are very social animals, after all, uh, the reaction against inequality, it's also unavoidable. I mean, as you might be aware, there are many experiments with chimpanzees and how they react when they are, mm, when they are treated differently. They act violently. They are, animals, but we humans, 
we might not be so violent, but we do feel that type of discomfort. So while we all agree that uh, total equality is not something that we seek, because I, I, I'm okay with having my own face, <laughs> but at some point it's unavoidable to, to feel discomforted by it. And my question is, uh, where do we put that limit between the um, natural inequality that accompany us humans and if we could ever <laughs> uh, allow and to which degree we can allow inequality to prosper? Okay, and going with the same topic, my question will be uh, keeping in mind that the technology, as you said before, is just uh, advancing and the artificial intelligence is going to make as a consequence uh, a loss of a lot of labor and jobs for the humans, how this will translate in equality in terms of social and economic equality compared us with another beings like animals or artificial beings? Okay, we have two questions down here. Here, at the front row, please. Okay. I've been interested um, in this discussion about um, civilization and tribal societies, because I think that what we've seen in the world recently is the extent to which um, people behave in tribal ways. It's just that they don't call it that, and I'm grateful to Wada for drawing attention to that fact. But my, my question actually um, relates to this quest, the issue of the fear of artificial intelligence. Um, although you spent a lot of time in the past, and I just don't want to go there because there are so many misconceptions that it's just not possible to, to deal with them. But if we look to the future, um, you, you talked about artificial intelligence and its potential. I find myself, ev almost every vision of the future that we have seen, whether it's in films or in books, more so in films, is always some form of dystopia. So that even if we want to level things out in families, and then um, uh, the next generation is not to have the advantages that the, the first generation built up. So you have some kind of brave new world or you know, totalitarian taking away of children from their parents. There's always some element of something horrible going on, either disrupting natural human feelings, or um, you have to allow a continued piling up of inequalities. And I wonder where the balance lies between those, whether, whether either of the speakers has an idea, whether there's a happy mean, because as I said, almost every vision of the future is one of a dystopian, Future. And, I, and I find myself asking, is that because just like um, God is supposed to have made man in his own image, we also make um, the idea of robots, if I can use that word, in our own image, and therefore we put into them this idea that somehow somebody's got to be top dog, somebody has to suppress in order for the, um, I mean, the whole Terminator thing that the Machines can't just go off and live as machines. What do they need humans for? What's their business with humans? But instead, they have to exterminate the humans and, in fact, even travel through time to kill them. I wonder whether we're projecting a kind of view of humanity onto... And, and whether, if, if that's the, the dominance that we have at the moment, whether we should, in fact, be worried about it or whether there are other aspects of humanity that we can identify and instill into this artificial, perhaps an emotional intelligence along with the artificial intelligence. Okay. And the last question here, please. Short. Short. <laughs> what are the main instruments of economic policy that may increase the level of justice and therefore diminish inequality? 
Okay. Thank you. Good question. Please. So, uh, I think uh, we have anyway. our final okay. no? Quick answers. Now. Just I would take the angle of biotechnology and information, uh, 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 sorry, artificial intelligence, just to say we don't know. Really, I agree with you. I agree with your analysis. We normally are scared of the future because we don't want to abandon our comfort zone that we have adapted to. Now, there are trends, as I said. I would count these three trends as the major trends that might have a social and political and, and economic uh, uh, implications on us. The first one is networking, and I do believe it is positive. I think this is something that will carry a lot of value to us and in the case of equality and justice that might become a major issue. Then we have the artificial intelligence. There is a very beautiful side for it because definitely with artificial intelligence we will have access to a collective mind which has not yet born. I mean the concept that I'm going to have a cloud, I am tapped to in it and then analytically I'm getting from it a huge amount of knowledge. This is definitely a great achievement of the human mind. In the next 20 years, most likely, you know, we expect that we might really reach a moment of the singularity where we are, I mean, the machine is capable of producing to us a huge amount of knowledge through processing this collective data that we are accumulating. This is very beautiful and it's going to change a lot of what we do. But it has also a negative side, which is to what extent we can allow artificial intelligence to replace our own judgment. Because so far, none of us has been able to judge whether these robots that you are referring to or the artificial intelligence per se is going to have the emotional intelligence as well necessary to define certain kind of concept. Some people think that it is positive because it will be much more objective rather than the subjectivity of the human biases. Some people would say we might even lose control because machines could start defining the new rules and morality for us and they might even force us to follow it and discriminate against us. This is another object uh, of discussion internationally. The third one is about biotechnology, the third the trend. There is definitely a very positive side of it. Now we can eliminate the concept of inheritant, inheritant uh, diseases like you know, diabetics and many others through redesigning the genome of the human being and cutting the chromosomes that are bad, replacing them with good ones, and therefore we might come up with much more healthy and, 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 and uh, powerful human being. This is positive and this is good. But also the negative side is, is immense. Given the fact that the laboratories of today are busy developing techniques that not all of them are so charitable and fantastic, especially the military laboratories, I would argue that we might face in the future huge ethical and moral dilemmas of to what extent the definition of a human being versus the others is going to be evolving through biotechnology. So again, what I'm saying, we had a chance, by the way, you remember the concept of cloning a few years ago, when the humanity stood in a very, in my opinion, very positive moment. All of us stood to define the ethics and morality of what cloning should be, that was, in my opinion, a successful attempt of the humanity to achieve something positive. And we did achieve positive side in it. Are we going to lose our authority collectively over these trends and it's going to be hijacked by self-interest corporations or even gangs or even uh, parallel you know, organizations to develop it and use it? We don't know. But for now, what I'm calling for is an international or a universal stance of people in order to define the ethical and moral foundations of these kind of innovations before it goes beyond, you know, beyond control. And, and monitor everything that happens. The society should start monitoring that in order to make sure that it doesn't go into the wrong hands or wrong dimension. Thank you. Please. Well, I think I, <clears throat> I was not clear enough before in the sense that now eugenics is a condemned world, word. We don't even mention it. But uh, Dalton was a cousin of Darwin, and uh, his chair of eugenics was considered the most scientific in his time. The idea 
that man can treat himself as a, um, a person who grows cattle or who grows plants and intends to make them better, the plants or the animals. The idea that man can act upon himself, making him better through any means, is taking mankind as a means instead of an end in itself. It's a monstrosity. It's the deepest formulation we can obtain of a monstrosity. Dr. Franz Genstein. So any development of intellectual, um, artificial intelligence or of technique, of manipulation of, 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 of um, molecular matters that affects man unless it is completely voluntary and transparent, in my opinion, is a crime against mankind, should be persecuted as such. We have had all the 20th century as an experience for the mm, uh, crazy idea of Dalton, based on his cousin, that mankind can get better through eugenics. Later on, Stalin, Lenin, Hitler, Pol Pot, all type of guys, have tried to make mankind better. This is monstrosity. This is abomination, in my opinion. Okay. Well, so with those two final conclusions, we can finish the session, I think so. No more questions and... Uh, do we have time for one more question, Jacques? Okay. Hi. Um, okay, my question has to do with an expectation I had at this debate. For me, inequality meant that we were going to talk about specifically uh, economic equality, inequality. Yeah. About, um, I, I, I'm a bit surprised we didn't talk about neoliberal economies, about um, poverty, and I have the feeling that the discussion was hijacked by. Um, reproducing a dichotomic view of the world as West versus non-West. Ver uh, uh, we didn't mention, but it's, there's Islamophobia that is the elephant in the room also. So I wonder why you think this happened? Oh. Why do you think that this was uh, what you presented to us as inequality in the world today? Thank you. The origins of inequality. You're asking about the origins of inequality. I should say that the origin of inequality is the difference between a person who decides to work, uh, for example, to build a well to recover the water that comes in the winter but doesn't come in the summer, and the other person who decides to pray, to pray to the god of, of uh, rain, saying that, oh, oh, I want some water. The, to answer the question, actually, just to make a final contribution, I think there was a question as well yeah. about what is the mechanism that could be used to achieve. Uh, I am, you know, really developing a very positive idea about this concept of basic income, the minimum income for humans in order to survive and to later on flourish and to use the rest of their neurons. But I think a lot of people can't have access to their neurons because they are busy trying to struggle and strive. So one of the techniques, one of the major themes that maybe we need to explore seriously and to really put it under you know, good analysis is the issue of basic income. And I do support it at this stage at least until proven otherwise because I couldn't find any other. If we would leave this concept of, of uh, inequality to its logical end, Definitely, we will continue maximizing the gap between the rich and the poor. And this definitely is not going to create neither prosperity 
nor uh, the peace amongst societies internationally. So yes, I would I would use that that technique as as a stepping stone towards a much more just and equal uh, economic structure. Well, this is very interesting because uh, Swiss people, which is in my opinion the only country that can pay for it, because one thing is that we want basic rent. Another thing is that we have um, a budget capable of, of really answering the question. I think that the Swiss have answered 74% against all on their own. And uh, it, of course, I'm not uh, against or pro, I don't know. S sincerely, so, I haven't th been thinking on the matter. So I would, I would invite you to the second session tomorrow, which yeah. in which this yeah. uh, well, topic it. will be yeah. discussed. That's it. But we have to take into account that the only country that is really prosperous enough to address this matter has decided that this would stimulate um, the, the opposite to diligence. And diligence is the difference between building a well or praying to the god of the rain. I think mankind has not yet obtained a level of technical development. Actually, uh, uh, you know, I would say that my father, I remember when I was young, and I think he didn't change that habit. He was a farmer, and he was definitely doing his best to, I mean, fix the land, put the seeds, put the fertilizers, and after he finishes everything, he used also to pray to God that rain should come. I don't think a contradiction could happen between both of them. And at least my father always succeeded in doing that. It is a contradiction, my friend, because <laughs> the countries of Africa, they don't build wells. I, I insist there is a contradiction, and that's the difference in renta per capita of Africa and Europe.